Hopefully that was a good first session. Welcome to the first breakout. You've chosen wisely if you have kids, uh, I think, I hope. Um, let, me, let me do a poll just because it'll help me and I want to know. How many of you in this room like, don't have kids at all? Okay, it, it, that's because you're, you're young and you're trying to catch. Is there any grandparents in here that have kids out of the house? Okay, are you here to support or are you here because you want to raise grandkids? That's what I want to know. Okay, okay, good. That's good. That's good. Okay, um, and uh, what's, uh, do, how many in here have teenagers right now? Okay, we got a lot of teenage parents. And then how many of you have younger ones, elementary school age? Okay, we get there. Well, I will tell you that I, I did because, you know, one of the things that we do in AV is we have such a big uh, church full of lots of different things that we split so many things up. So when I hear the word kids, I automatically think elementary school um, because we separate teenagers. And so I prepped most of this oriented towards the younger age kids. So I will work on the fly as I'm teaching this to move it on up for you teenage parents. But I will encourage you uh, that we have two more things oriented towards families here uh, for this weekend. That's Pastor Lucas' session on um, how to have a Bible-saturated home. He's here. He's going to steal all my content and then just reteach that. So it should be very similar. Uh, that's not true at all. He's got his own stuff. And then Pastor John's going to be teaching something on uh, developing a biblical worldview for your teenagers. So if you've got teenagers, you can partake in those. And we were told that you can maybe switch sessions. And so, you know, if this is your, your bread and butter, the family stuff, and you didn't get into those bother the, the people that are there and at the registration table and get to where you want to go. Well, I, I am Pastor Doug. I am um, a pastor at Aliso Viejo at Compass Bible Church. Um, I am a family pastor, and that is because I run our kids ministry program there, and I'm the children's pastor, and I also run a family ministry for parents of teenagers. So I have my, my foot in both worlds of kids as they go through and then working with parents in, uh, that have teenagers. So uh, I'm excited to jump in. I care a lot about this subject because I'm sure Sure you do how to raise Bible-centered kids because I have kids. These are my kids here, my two girls. This is Allie and Emmy. Allie is uh, nine, about to turn 10 in August, and Emmy is seven. And uh, this is something that I care deeply about, not only as a parent that wants to raise Bible-centered kids, but also as a person that has a responsibility uh, in the church to see our church uh, disciple and raise up Bible-centered kids within our church. So hopefully we'll be able to gain some insight together into how to do this. And I want to get fairly practical with you as we move on, um, but because this is such a big topic, we're going to be pretty broad here. So I'm going to paint with some broad strokes, and then I'm going to leave some time at the end for question and answer. If you guys have some burning things that are coming up in your mind as we're talking, how do we do this? How do we approach this? How do we focus on that with our kids in our situation? Write them down. That's what you got a note sheet for. I'll leave some time at the end as best as I can for us to jump into that at the end to give you some time. Well, let me just jump off by saying, what is this whole topic all about? How would I define what a Bible-centered kid is? And I'll say that partly because I think we're talking a little bit of a different category than a Bible-centered adult. Usually, you're not a Bible-centered adult unless you are a believer, but I think for most of us, we're going to be looking at kids that God has yet to redeem, yet to save. Some are, some are not. Most are not. And so what does it mean to actually be a Bible-centered kid? This is just some definitional uh, things that I threw together to help us think about what it means to have a kid be Bible-centered. I would say this is the idea of what it means to be centered is that it is the source that they always go back to. It's the thing that their life flows from. When they have a question, they go back to the source of the Bible. When they have problems, they go back to the source of the Bible. When they're intrigued by something going on in their world, in their circumstance, or in their life, they go back to the Bible. When they want to know truth, they go back to the Bible. So it's the source of what they always go back to. I'd also say that the Bible functions practically for a Bible-centered kid as the foundational instruction that everything's built on. You're giving your kids instruction, but a Bible-centered kid is not just getting their instruction from the TV or from their teachers, but the source, the core, the heart of it is that the instruction that they're getting is coming from the pages of Scripture. That's what I would envision as a Bible-centered kid. I would say also that the Bible needs to be something that functions uh, practically in their lives. So this is something that you utilize as parents and that they utilize as parents for practical application in their life when they're trying to make a decision, when they're deciding which way they should go in a particular area of life, they are going to go to the Bible as uh, the, the function, functional reality of their life. And I think very importantly, 
uh, I want to see in Bible-centered kids that our kids value, they understand the value of the word, they esteem it, they, they recognize it for what it is as best as they can, giving their maturity and their age range, and that they learn to grow and love the Bible for what it is. So as they learn more about the Bible, they grow in their love for it, they value it, they esteem it. A few more things. If you didn't get all that, this is recorded, you can get it later, but we only have an hour and a half, and I tend to go long, so here we go. Um, I think a Bible-centered kid is going to have these components of their life too. They're going to be consistent in the Bible. They're not just going to be uh, kids that dabble in the Bible on the weekend or when they're at church, but there's going to be some consistency that goes on through their childhood and in their week-to-week, day-to-day activities of their life. I don't think you can say you have a Bible-centered kid or you're working towards having a Bible-centered kid if your life just consists of Bible on Sunday. Bible-centered kid needs to be consistent with their growth, knowledge, understanding, time, application of the Bible. That needs to be something consistent for them. And then here's the big pieces that we're going to flush out later, but they need to be growing in knowledge of the Bible. This is not just a one and done thing. I learned the story of Noah's Ark and now we're moving on. This is a perpetual, consistent application and growth of the Bible. And it goes beyond that in terms of thinking about what a Bible-centered kid is, is that it's not just about knowledge that it goes deeper and roots itself into an understanding of what the Word of God actually says and how they are to use that. And so um, we'll talk about this later as well, so don't, don't feel like you have to rush, but deepening understanding of the Bible. We want our kids to be going layers and layers deep in their understanding, not just in their knowledge. That's what I envision as a Bible centered kid. And then Building a worldview is something that I think is very important if we're talking about what it means to be a Bible-centered kid, that they see themselves through the lens of a biblical worldview, that they are thinking the Bible is informing all that they are doing, and they're able to see themselves and their world through the lens of how the Bible paints reality, paints them, paints who God is, paints who, how they should respond to their family. That's a lens that they view everything through. And uh, the last two things is that they are going to not just get in the Bible, read the Bible, try to grow in the Bible, but they grow to understand that the Bible is truth and it is God's revealed truth and is therefore absolute truth, that it is given to us by God and it should be accepted by them as truth, which is difficult in this context. And then, of course, the final two is that we want them to be obedient to the Bible's teachings to the best of their ability, knowing that most of our kids are not saved, and so that means some particular things, but we can still encourage them to be obedient in so many areas of the word and applying the Bible to their lives where applicable. Now, um, that tells you what the goal is, what the aim is, what we're looking for in terms of what we want our kids to be. If they're Bible-centered, they would be able to check those boxes. You could look at your kid and you can say, okay, my kid is right now, Bible-centered, and that's a good thing. That's, that's a focus that we want to have with our kids. Um, But I want us to to think about the difficulty of how hard this is because um, the goal of this is is to go further out. The goal of this is not to just check a box this week and say, my toddler is Bible-centered. It has a future progress bar that we're looking towards, and the challenge that we're facing now, I think, is a daunting challenge. So if we're going to talk anything about raising Bible-centered kids, we got to be realistic with the challenge. So the first thing is a main point that I really want you to think about is we need to face together to raise Bible-centered kids the current challenge, the current challenge that we're in. Now, I gave you some things of what it meant for a kid to be Bible-centered, but I want you to envision with me what it's like if the Bible is not in that center position in your kid's life. Think of your kid's faces right now and just imagine the world and imagine them if these realities don't have Bible on this line. If the, not the Bible, but something else is the source that they always go back to whether it's their own understanding of truth, whether it's their own vision of what they get in themselves and how that reflects upon the world, whether that's uh, some sort of textbook from a teacher, whatever the source may be, what is the source going to be if it's not the Bible? If the Bible is not central in your kid's life, then this blank is left open for something else to take the central piece of the source of what they're always going back to. Same with all the rest of these. If it's not 
the, the place they go to for instruction, what are they going to? Now, you might say, well, they go to me, that's good, and you can teach them these things, but you're a fallible person, we want to point them to the infallible word of God. You're an errant person, we want to point them to the inerrant word of God. We want to get them to the word as the central thing in their lives and not let them fill it with something else. If it's not essential to the function of their lives, what is? You can see how so many desires of our kids start to fill this spot when the Bible is not centrally located in their lives and in their hearts. If this is not something that they're dealing with on a daily basis, they're going to put Pokemon in that spot. They're going to put video games in that spot. They're going to put whatever it is, relationships. They're going to put even you as their parents in that spot if the Word of God is not put in that spot. And so we have to work hard to get it central in our kids' lives. If it's not valued and esteemed and loved... As the ultimate thing, what are they going to value, esteem, and love? They're going to find something else, an idol of some form in their life to put in that spot and to value it. And so as you think about the current challenge, we know how hard this is because we just don't live in in an isolated box. We have to deal with the world that's around us. And as you think about what it would be like to have a generation that grows up without the Bible being the central thing in the lives, what does it look like? Well, it looks like the opposite of what we said a Bible-centered kid looks like. It means that people are going to be inconsistent in the Bible or not care about the Bible or don't read the Bible or don't go to the Bible at all. They're going to be completely estranged from the Word of God if this is not a central part of their life. This is the direction and the move of our culture. They're going to be growing in confusion, not understanding. If a Bible-centered kid is going deeper in their understanding of the Word, then when the Bible moves out of that central place, all of a sudden people are now saying, I don't understand this book. I don't understand the context. I don't understand the stories. I don't understand what the Old Testament's all about. I don't understand what these words are. And people begin to get confused and frustrated and want to ditch the whole faith because of their confusion about the Bible. They might even grow in doubt or resistance against the Bible. Instead of developing a, a, a depth to them, an understanding, they're going to grow in doubt. They're going to start to question it because it's not something that they've spent enough time in and that's going to lead to some dire consequences. Or they begin to see themselves and the world not through a biblical lens, but through some other sort of lens. Whether that's a lens of, lens of some cult that comes in and evangelizes your kid and tells them that it's a lot easier than learning the Bible. Whether it's some other world religion that is going to come in and say, oh, you don't have to do all that in our religion, this is easier. Or whether it's some sort of secular worldview, some sort of humanistic uh, secularism and atheism and say, no, this is so much easier. I can see my life and the world through a anti-God, God God doesn't exist, atheistic lens. Isn't that so much easier for your life? And that's what we have going on right now in the culture. And of course, we see this every day in all the news, everywhere, that what's going to happen if they don't accept the Bible is absolute truth. They're going to accept their truth. They're going to become relativists. They're going to think that what they think is true is true and not what the authoritative word of God says is true. They, of course, are going to be disobedient to the Bible's teaching, and ultimately they are going to reject God, reject his plan of salvation, and reject the Bible as a ap- uh, thing they can apply to their lives. Now, I say this, and I think you can all agree with me that this is the trajectory that our culture is going in, but just to prove it one step for- further so you know the challenge that we're facing as parents This is a trend that's continuing to grow. I want to show you uh, this chart here. This is uh, by the American Bible Society, and it's polling different generations, the millennial generation, the Gen Z, and the youth of, uh, or Gen Gen Z, and then the Gen Z youth, because it's a big swath there of generations. And as you can see, what is happening is as each generation, and as everybody's getting older, Bible usage is declining rapidly. Among the millennials, which is where I'm at and where maybe some of you are at in that age range, 49% of people are now not Bible users. We've already clearly flipped right away from, from millennials to Gen Z, right on the cusp of what it is for the millennials just using the Bible. This isn't even engagement. This is just you're actively using it. As soon as you go over to Gen Z, all of a sudden we drop significantly. Now 57% of adults are saying, I don't use the Bible. It's not useful to me and not used in any way, and 43% are saying it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's barely there. That massive jump from 57% to 66%, it should scare us because our kids are in the next generation. If we don't take up the mantle for us to see the Bible be central in our kids' lives, what's the number going to be? Is it going to be 77%? Is it going to be 80%? 
What's the number of people that are going to say, the Bible has no use for me in my life? I've stopped using the Bible, I've stopped reading the Bible, I've stopped caring about the Bible. You can see that this is just Bible use, but think about that number, 34% say they're a Bible user, and 66% say that they're a non-Bible user in Gen Z. Now look at this chart. If you look at millennials and then Gen Z adults and Gen Z youth, and you look at the, at the top, only 9% of that Gen Z say they're engaged with the Bible. So maybe they would use it at a higher percentage, but whether it's something that they do regularly, they engage with it weekly or normally, 9% of people are self-identify, at least in this study, that they are engaged with the Bible, which means they're using it multiple times a week and using it in their lives. You can see that there is a massive, massive disengagement as the ranges go up in ages, and we have the responsibility given to God to us as parents to see the next generation's numbers go up, not down. We want at least our realm of responsibility to make sure that we're doing our part as parents and facing the current challenge that we're in here to not see these numbers go down, at least with those in our households, but to see them go the opposite direction. So we need to face the current challenge. So we saw the, the, the current decline of Bible-centeredness per generation. You guys see that clearly. But I think there's another thing that I, I, and this I know is depressing already, just keep with me here because I'm trying to build a case, uh, that there is also an, an additional factor to this, that not only is it just general Bible decline by generation, but there is an act of assault on our kids to get them to turn away from the Bible, turn into themselves, go to face their own desires and do whatever they want. And you see this all the time. This is happening inside and outside of the church. Outside of the church, you know it, you see it in the headlines every day. I don't need to harp on this. We've got stories about our kids being groomed and sexualized to become, um, you know, to do certain things to themselves sexually. We got people pushing our kids to go to drag shows with drag kings and pushing the LGBT, LGBTQ plus IAACBD agenda. We've got people pushing uh, woke Christianity and critical race theory. They're pushing our kids away from biblical doctrine, biblical truth, biblical reliance, and they're pushing them into a culture, and they are, they're pushing them down in doing this by leveling an a, a onslaught of societal shame against them if they would hold to such bigoted, hateful, demeaning things that the Bible says. Now, this is the reality that we're facing right now, and that's why it is so important. And you know that this is coming from everywhere. This isn't just in one facet of life. This is in so many facets of life. It's in entertainment. It's in social media, of course. It's in our schools with some of our educators, not all but some. It's some, a big swath of our government is pushing these agendas. We're no longer just being passive and it's happening. It is now an onslaught. It is an assault. It is a forward motion against our kids to take them out of the rootedness of the Bible and put them into this worldly way of thinking. It's done by companies, local or corporate, and even those in our own communities. Our friends and the people that we know and our family members are even pushing people away from the, from the truth, our kids away from the truth. Sometimes when I think, and I know this is not the case, but when I think about previous generations and I think about their attack on our kids, sometimes it seems like it just comes one shot at a time. Even when I was a kid and I did not grow up in a Christian home, there was these constant conversations about, okay, we've got to deal with this one issue. Now it's evolution in our schools. There's one thing and we're fighting against it. Now we're dealing with, uh, uh, we're going to legalize gay marriage and that's going to be a public thing. It's just become normal now. There's one thing and there's another thing and there's another thing. And they kind of come sequentially and it feels like we're just trying to, as parents, defend all of this stuff that's coming after our kids, but it's kind of coming slow. And I don't know about you, but this is what it feels like right now. It feels like as parents, we have a massive, massive responsibility to protect our kids from what's coming at them from the world, but also to build this desire in their own lives to be Bible-centered. So we have a lot of stuff going on with our kids, but I'll just mention one last thing that's going on, which is not an assault just from outside of the church, but also inside of the church uh, there is movements even within, inside of the church, and I put parentheses around that because I don't really think they're the church, to try to get our kids to question the authority of anybody or anything that has authority in their life. There is movements, and this movement you may have heard is called deconstruction, this idea that there is uh, Christians, evangelical Christians, that are trying to get especially young people to question the foundations of what they know about God and His Word and 
question the authorities that God has placed in their life, whether that be the word of God, whether that be their pastors and teachers, whether it be church and churches and other institutions that taught them things about faith, that they are pushing young people to question everything they knew in order to redefine and reconstruct a faith without the confines of authority in their life. And you think about that, what is that essentially trying to do? It's trying to rid the Bible as the central authority in their life, and this is happening within the church. Um, if you don't know anything about that, uh, you can look up some stuff that we did. I taught a lesson on this, um, an abide lesson, and I can get you that information on deconstruction. And then we also had our women's ministry director at Compass AV do her hot topic on this issue just a few weeks ago because we want our church to be equipped to deal with this issue. This is something that's happening not just outside the church, but inside the church. So you guys agree with me that this is a bigger challenge than is typically faced us. And so we need to be more concerned. I think all of you, I would plead with you, we need to care about having our kids be Bible-centered. Before we do that, let me just do this because I have to, okay? You may, and I hope you're not, and I know this group, and so I don't think this is, this is big for many of you, but you may be sitting here thinking, um, yeah, but it's not like that here. Now, if you're from California, you're probably not saying that, but if you're from Texas <laughs> or you're from Idaho, you might be thinking, yeah, but it's not like that here. And I'll just say, we are living in a time that is different with technology. We're living in a monoculture. Whether it's, it's here fully or not, it's coming, right? This onslaught against your kids, it's coming one way or another. You can try to escape as many places as you want, but it's not going to help. At some point, this is coming, and so we got to defend against it and do our best to raise Bible-centered kids. Maybe you're thinking something like, well, isn't this only a, a big deal once they become teenagers? To which I would say, if you haven't started when they're young at this point, then you've got to work extra, 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 extra hard. Because what you need to be doing is building a foundation of care and concern about the Bible, teaching from the Bible, so that they can be prepared to deal with this when they're a teenager. If you've done nothing to train and raise your kids to be biblically centered by the time of teenagers, then you you've really need to double down. You need to put blinders on, and that's all you need to focus on. So it's not true that this is not something that doesn't affect our kids now, our young kids now. You might be thinking, yeah, it was bad when I was a kid, and I turned out okay. Well, by the grace of God, you turned out okay, okay? Uh, and we hope and pray that that is the case for our kids, but we don't want to be ignorant or arrogant and thinking that this is just going to be fine because we're fine. We don't want to play those kind of games. We want to double down with our experience of raising Bible Center kids. I, I've heard so many parents say this over the years that I just have to address this briefly, um, which is, if I push the Bible on my kids, won't that push my kids away? If I shove this down their throat, won't that make my kids rebel against me? I want to keep a relationship with my kids, and so I'm just going to go you know, mild at this and, and not go crazy. Um, I'll just say that when I stand before the Lord, I want to be able, and I hope you want to be able to say, I gave it my all. I tried my hardest. I expended myself in this effort. And whether or not my kids reject the truth and reject the word of God and reject the faith is ultimately not up to me. It is up to them and up to their Lord, whether he has chosen them and whether or not they are going to respond to the gospel. But I want to do everything in my power to say, I've, I've done my duty. I can stand before the Lord with a clean conscience and say, I have worked hard. I have labored for my kids in this regard. And so if this is a, a, an area of thought that even has popped in your mind, well, if I, if I, if I go too hard, if I, if I focus on this too much, isn't this just going to drive my kids crazy? Well, do it wisely, do it tactfully, do it gently, but keep going. Don't worry about whether they get pushed away. That's really ultimately up to the Lord. Um, I hope no one's saying this, because, but maybe you are. You're saying, my kids already get it. You know, my kid's like seven, and they get it. They're great, and so I'm not worried. Well, puberty, I'll just say that. Uh, <laughs> teenage years, you guys know what that looks like. I know what that looks like leading a, a marriage ministry with parents of teenagers. And so uh, things change all the time. So whether they're there now or not, it's a big deal. Uh, if Bible goes down, church engagement goes down. And I want you to look at this church because look at the number of, of youth that say they're practicing Christians is 10%. This is just Bible use, Bible engagement. They're saying, I'm a Christian. And then look at the next one, non-practicing Christian. What does that even mean? Okay, Our categories are so off now, we're changing our categories, and people are leaving the church because they're leaving the Bible as their core. All right? So... We need to face this challenge together, but I also want you to consider just briefly, I want you to consider the significance of this. 
If you do not raise Bible-centered kids, we already talked about what's, what could happen. Their, their lives could be oriented with something else at the center. But I want you to actually think about this as parents in this room, about the future significance of what you're working towards. What is your goal in raising your kids? And I'll just throw some things on the screen because we all have so many goals for our kids, but what are your goals, what are your priorities as a parent? All of us want our kids to be smart, to be educated, to have options for careers. We want them to play sports or to have opportunities or future possibilities for their growth and engagement. This is something that we can prioritize in our parenting. We could care about their health, their happiness, their fulfillment, their mental health, their satisfaction, their, their, their purpose in life. We want them to be fulfilled in some way, shape, or form. We could care about this deeply. We want them to grow up and get married and have a family and be productive citizens and, and church members, and this is all good. All of these things you could see could be good things, but if we miss the prioritization of the word being centered in our life, then we're forgetting about what should be the most important thing, the highest priority, priority, which is their salvation and their sanctification. Whenever I'm leading anything for kids, it is always my prayer that whether God uses what we're doing now in the moment or he he uses it in the future to come, that he is working with the word of God to build a foundation to see these kids get saved. We want to see our kids, and it should be our constant prayer, that we want to see our kids get saved. We want them to be redeemed. We want them to be plucked out of the dark and put into the light. We want them to escape the punishment of God and be placed into Christ. And we want to see them ultimately, when they come to Christ, grow in Christ. And the only way that can happen, as Pastor Mike just said in his message, as you heard, is through the Word of God. So your goal as parents, all these other things, put it underneath the salvation and sanctification and make this your goal. This is your aim. When you wake up in the morning, you say, what am I going to do today to parent my kids? Goal number one, I want my kids to learn about the word of God so that one day God could use his word to save my kids. I want my kids to know the word of God so that one day my God could use the foundation of God's word to see my kids sanctified in his truth. Then worry about school. Then worry about all these things. Put your priorities in place because if you don't have this in place, the Bible won't be central in your kids' lives. You guys know this verse. We could care about all these things. What profit is a man gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? That's got to be a a verse that you know and are thinking of as a parent. What does it matter if my kid has a great marriage, a great life, a great house, lives in a great city, is a productive citizen, is happy and healthy, and is damned to hell? If that doesn't bother you, it should bother you, and your priorities need to be realigned. The reason why this is important is because of passages that Pastor Mike talked about that I'll reference here. It is by the Word of God, the instrumentality of the Word of God, that we know about Christ to be saved. So it is, yes, it is God's desire for us to be saved, and it is through Him that we're saved, but it's through the instrumentality of His Word that He brings us about. Passages like James 1.18, passages like 1 Peter 1.23. It's through the living and abiding word of God, through the means of this. It is through the agent of Jesus and through the instrumentality of the word of God, the word of truth, the gospel as it is preached. Or Ephesians 1.13. It's that you're found in him when you respond to the gospel, which is the word of truth. And that needs to be told, it needs to be heard. And once you believe in him, then you're promised, you're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. It's through the instrumentality. So the significance of this Bible-centeredness is not just to have happier kids. It's not just to have healthier kids. It's not just for them to be wise in this current world. That, those are all good things, but we want them to first and foremost be saved, and that's got to be your desire to have Bible-centered kids. All right. So consider the future significance. You can write this one down. I'm going to skip. I'm already going too long. 2 Timothy 3, 13 and 14. Actually, this is a good one. Verse 15. <laughs> I'll read verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned. This is Paul talking to Timothy. From what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it. And how, now listen to this, think about your kids. How from childhood you have been acquainted, this is like an intimate knowledge, right, of with the sacred writings. This is talking about the word of God. And then listen to this line. Which are able, right, through the instrumentality of such, to make you wise for salvation through faith. It's through faith in Christ, but the instrumentality of the word of God is in place and can be put in place even as parents to your children from their childhood. 
that you're building a foundation of an acquaintance, a knowledge, an intimacy, a depth with the scripture that God is then able to use later in your kids' lives to see them come to salvation in faith through Christ. That's what we're aiming for. That's what our goal is. All right. So what are we going to do? We need to think about this holistically if we're going to raise Bible-centered kids if we're going to face the current challenge, if we're going to really think about our priorities and what the significance of all this is, we need to go big and we need to think about our whole life, what it means to have a Bible-centered life. And so the first thing I want to say is that you need to participate in a Bible-centered church. Now, if you're here, hopefully you're a part of one of our Compass churches. If you're not, I would encourage you to be a part of one of our Compass churches or find a Bible-centered church. But what I say here is not to attend a church. I want you to participate in a Bible-centered church. This is not just attendance. This is not just coming on Sunday. This is getting enmeshed in the life of the church, immersing yourself in the, the work of the church, serving, participating, teaching where you can, jumping in as a leader where you can, because your life being centered around the church is going to affect your kids greatly. If your life is built around all kinds of other things, First, and not the church as the core hub of what everything revolves around, and it's a Bible-centered church that needs to be a priority, then how are your kids going to ever understand that the Bible is, needs to be central in their life? If the Bible is what we're teaching in our churches and Bible-centered churches that are expositorily preaching the Word of God and proclaiming a biblical gospel, if that's not a priority in your life and if you have not made that a priority to get involved in that, then you're not going to be able to build a Bible-centered life and you're going to have a struggle to raise Bible-centered kids. So don't just attend, immerse yourselves. And then I'll say this because I'm a kidsman guy and I have the microphone so I could say whatever I want. Um, I'm, I'm actually surprised how few people come up to me as the kidsman pastor and ask what it is we're doing in kidsmen. I'm really surprised by that. I, 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 they might know... Uh, a little bit, they, they have a sense of what's going on, but I, I'm surprised how few people are saying, what is your goal in kids' ministry? What are you trying to accomplish as a church that my kids are involved with? What are you trying to build and grow? What are the things you're covering? What are your offerings? What is your program trying to accomplish in your kids' ministry? So if you don't know what your kids' men plan is doing in your church, the philosophy, their goals, their programs, go ask them. Ask them what they're doing so that you can know what your church is doing to help equip your kids. Understand your, your, your church's kids' men plan. And then I'll say this. Once you know that, then it becomes easier for you as a parent because you're not just starting from scratch, people here, a part of a church. You're not having to build this whole thing by yourselves. You've got a group of pastors who care about this deeply, who are building a plan to help to, to help teach your kids, disciple your kids, get them to be Bible-centered. And so you can start with their plan and work from there. You can say, what, what are they doing? How can I reinforce what they're doing? And now how can I build on top of what they're doing? How can I grow off of this foundation that the church is doing in my kids' lives and put that in line with your plan for your kids' discipleship? And then I would say this to encourage you, there's so many opportunities for our kids to grow in relationships, so whether that's sports leagues or activities or whether that's in their school or through families or friends. But one of the things that you should do is you should really work to establish your kids' friendships within the church. It doesn't mean it's, it's wrong to have friends outside of the church, but you need to understand that your kids are going to be pulled to whatever it is that they connect with. And if their central desire is to hang out with Johnny at school and Johnny is a, is a, a little demon, I'm sorry to say, that's not the right f- phrase for a kids and pastor to say, but you know what I mean? If he is just bad and he's rotten and he's bad, then your kid's going to be pulled towards that. And so you need to build the relationship core around the people in the church and the parents of the church who are going to do the same thing you're doing. Build your core there and then go out from that. And if your kid's Johnny, I'm sorry, uh, I don't mean to say that he's a demon. Um, And then last but not least is uh, plan your activities around the life and the programs of what's going on in the church. And and I I say this, we put a lot of effort into what we do with our kids. 
if we are teaching something or if we've got a program going on, if we're planning a Camp Compass, which is our version of a vacation Bible school, uh, there is an intention behind that and a lot of effort that truly and honestly is going to be difficult for you to replicate. And if you just happen to be gone that week because you planned your vacation for that week, I think you're missing out as a pastor. I think if you're not putting your kids in the camps and the programs and the opportunities and the summer camps and the kids' programs that the church is providing, then, then you're, you're reorient, you need to reorient your life first and foremost if this is your priority. If your priority is for your kid to be a professional baseball player and baseball camps on the same week, then I get it. But what I'm proposing is that you need to have your priorities be flipped around Bible-centeredness, and that's what we're trying to do in the church. And so work with us, not just to see our numbers increase. Our goal, our desire, is to see your kids know the Word of God. That is our whole aim, and we put a lot of effort and energy into that. So plan your activities, plan your life around the programs of the church. All right, so you need to participate in Bible Center Church, and then I'm going to go through this very quickly. You need to be Bible Centered parents, and the reason why I'm going to do this quickly is because Pastor Lucas told me that this is what he's going to talk about, so I'm going to steal his main passage, Deuteronomy 6, and I'm going to say, this starts with you. This is an overflow from you. If you do not care about the Word of God, if this is not something that's passionate, uh, a passionate desire of your life, if it's not all of your care, uh, then it's not going to overflow to your children, okay? So uh, see Pastor Lucas's lesson for more. Correct, Pastor Lucas? Okay, give me a nod. Is that all you're going to talk about? No, more than that. All right. Participate in a Bible-centered church. Be Bible-centered parents. Um, and then I think this is the core of what we're going to talk about. Develop a Bible-centered home. Uh, you need to develop a Bible-centered home in everything that you do, and that is an outflow of that passage as well, that in everything that we do, even writing God's law on the doorposts and the gates of our home um, needs to be centered around the Word of God. So let me give you uh, what I want to use as a, a main thrust of how we're going to do this as parents. Um, Matthew chapter 13, the well-known parable of the sower, uh, this story of uh, a gardener, really, a farmer of some kind going out and casting seeds. And if you see the very beginning of this passage, Jesus is telling this parable to try to illustrate something, and he says that there was a sower who went out to sow, and as he sowed some seeds, they went to different types of soils. Okay? Um, now, I don't know if you guys are gardeners or not. I have recently become a gardener. Uh, I want to be a gardener. I don't know why. My wife's kind of annoyed by it. And I don't want to just garden like succulents, which is what she does because she can't kill them. I want, I want food that produces f something to eat. If I'm going to put the energy into gardening, I don't want it to just look pretty. I want it to sustain me in some sort of way. I want it to have some sort of benefit to me. And so I have become very... Um, somewhat obsessed with all things gardening. And um, I can tell you as an aspiring and horrible failure of a gardener that looking at this idea of taking a seed and wanting it to germinate is, is way more complicated than we understand it to be. And the factors, the contributing factors to this are so hard. But the first and most important factor of wanting to actually garden is that you actually try to garden. That you take the seeds and you don't just do what I did, which is probably for like three months, I just watched YouTube videos in bed after my wife went to sleep about how to garden. At some point, the knowledge that you're gaining here has to go into actually planting seeds. Just like it did for me, at some point I had to get out in the garden, get my hands in the dirt, and put some seeds in the ground and start trying to cultivate those seeds. And I had a, lot, a very long and difficult and arduous learning process of seeing things work and fail and work and fail and all the squirrels eat my crops, um, which happened the day before we left, just so you know. I have one radish remaining. Um, so the first thing we need to do in terms of thinking about this is that we need to be people that are, are scattering seeds, scattering seeds, scattering seeds. And so I'll put it this way. We need to be people that are cultivating Bible knowledge, okay? The, the seeds that are re being referred to is the word of truth. This is the word of God. This is the Bible. This is the scripture. We are wanting to get the seeds out there. We can't just sit on them. We can't just learn about them for ourselves. We need to actually open our mouths and teach them. We need to get into the word. And so let me just fly through some, some things that you should be doing. First and foremost is 
just plain and basic and simple Bible reading with your kids. Now, I know that this is very obvious, but let me just give you some further reasons for this. If you're going to cultivate Bible knowledge, um, you need to be in the Word itself, but here's some reasons for that. Don't just assume that they're getting everything they need from church. Don't just assume that they're getting everything they need when they maybe go to some class with some friend or they're getting it in some school that they're at. Um, you need to make sure that they are hearing the word of God from you. And so you need to have some time as a family or just you and your kids or getting them on their own or encouraging them or coming alongside of them to hear the word of God for themselves. I think about the passage where Jesus talks about not restraining the kids from coming to him um, to receive what he has to offer. And I think we sometimes treat the word of God like it's challenging, so challenging for kids that it's like, oh, we'll get to that later. Let me tell you some things about God. Let me give you some insights without actually just giving them the word of God. What does it say? Tell them what it is. Let them hear it for themselves and let them come with childhood, childlike faith and at least respond to what they can respond to of the word of God. I think it's important in getting to an actual Bible to get them familiar with the actual text themselves. The first time your kid hears the word Leviticus, they have no, it's just complete gibberish to them. They have no idea what's going on. They don't know what the Old Testament is. They don't know what the New Testament is. They don't know words. You say propitiation. They don't know what that is. You want there to be some familiarity with God's word so that it's not as daunting, so that it's not as difficult for them to engage with. Uh, it's going to be helpful for them to learn how to navigate the Bible if you're actually spending time in a real, actual, physical Bible. Understanding the, the, the stories as they go through chronologically, what the books are all about, learning how to jump back and forth between books, find passages, find verses. Again, I'm talking mainly for younger kids here. Um, and then even as we move towards older, older kids, what we're wanting to form, even prior to a regeneration moment, is we're wanting to form some, some sense of habits in their lives. If, if the Bible is central to them, we're wanting to say that if it's central, then you should be spending time in it. You should be doing this on a regular basis. You should be diving into it regularly, and so we want to form those habits. Okay, now uh, we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, but here are some things that I think for you as a parent, as you're diving into the Word of God, whether that be an infant's Bible that just goes through the basics or whether this be an actual Bible that your sixth grader or your junior higher is now taking and reading for themselves, how do you, as a parent, come alongside and help in their development of Bible knowledge, okay? And I'm going to propose that most of this takes place by you encouraging them to do things, but then asking lots of questions to your kids to help them to do this. So here's questions that you can ask them and questions you should ask yourself to help them grow in this. So first things first is they need to know what the Bible is all about generally. They might have been going to church, your kids, for, for years and years and years. And if you were to ask them, what is the Bible all about? I'd be curious what your kid's answer is. Have you taught your kids what the central message of the scripture is? Do they know what the Bible in general and in totality is all about? Do they have a big picture view of the Bible? Or do they think it's just something that we do at church? Do they think it's just something that's helpful to learn how to not disobey your parents, which is what they learn all the time in church, right? Do, what do they think about the Bible? And then you want to form that in them. Form in them that the Bible is about God's plan of redemption for a people and that he is coming to establish a kingdom and he is forming kingdom citizens of which he offers us through Christ to be a part of. I mean, there's lots of ways you can form this, but this central message of the Bible is a message of redemption and it is a message of kingdom as we're moving towards uh, the, the ultimate fulfill, fulfillment of what Christ has done for us here as he comes and rules and reigns. Point to them the big picture, the big picture. They need to know that. Then I think one of the things that you need to make sure your kids know in terms of just knowledge base is about the actual structure and reality of the Bible. So they need to understand what the Old Testament is, they need to understand what the New Testament is, and then you should work down from there that they know the general ideas of what's going on in each biblical book. Now, early on in your parenting, uh, the Old Testament is actually going to be your friend, and the New Testament will be a bit of your enemy, because once we get into the epistles and you try to explain what this book is all about, that becomes quite challenging. But when you're in the book of Genesis, or you're in the book of Exodus, or you're in these narrative stories, even in Leviticus, talking about the law, 
your kids can grasp that very, very, very early. And they should have at least a foundation from, from as soon as you can that then slowly is built upon as they age. They're learning more and more and more about what each book is about. And I, and I say this as someone who didn't have this as a kid, and I've thought a lot about this. If, if I had to go back and teach myself or teach my kids or direct a bunch of kids, what would I want to have? And I would want to have this foundation laid in my life of the individual books. Okay? So what are the, the main themes of the book? What are the main points of the book? If you don't know that, this is like a two-minute read in a study Bible. You can open up a study Bible, and on the introductory page of a book, you can read what this is all about. And you can begin to teach your kids a one-liners about each book of the Bible and, and, and do this. And there's some resources that can help you. Uh, you should get them to understand some main themes of what are going on in the individual books. Not just, hey, the book of Genesis is starting in creation and going to the establishment of God's people up to Joseph, or, uh, up to Joseph right? We can, that we could do that with Genesis, but now what are some of the things that are going on? What are the themes? Oh, we're talking about creation. We're talking about the establishment of God's people. We're talking about him calling out Abraham and calling a people for himself and making covenants to both Adam and to, to Noah and to Abraham and continuing on. And so you can begin to develop some themes that are going on, some main points. And I, and I, I say this because I think what most of us are doing when we're, we're getting into the Bible is we're just, we're going to read the Bible right now. We're just, we're just going to read it. We need to go a step layer if we're going to have Bible-centered kids. We need to make sure that we're getting into some of these details. Now, this one is, is the one that we all do all the time, but they need to get into the stories of the Bible, the narratives, uh, to be able to articulate what these stories are actually about. Give us some details about what's going on in these particular stories. Same thing with characters. Our kids can learn a lot about the characters that uh, are real people, that really existed, that walked with God, that failed, that followed after him. And so these are valuable insights for us. And so your kids should be able to, to say and know the names of Bible characters. And um, it's really fun to do this, by the way, because your kids think they're really, really smart and that because they know like Noah and Abraham. And as soon as you start naming like, who's Zipporah? They're like, what? Um, and it, they just get so excited to learn about different people and who they were. And you could build that excitement for them, getting to know these people's stories. Kids resonate with the stories of people, individuals. And then I do think it is important for you to get into the facts with your kids. To say, to figure out what happened. What did they do? Where did they go? What, what happened in the narratives? We're drilling down into getting into what the Bible is, is doing in its parts here. And it's important for our kids to know that. You can drill down into context. You can, you can uh, help them figure out what's going on in terms of context, what happened before, what happened after. Well, do you remember this? Do you remember that? You remember this was just said, so now this is a response, some context pieces. And then, of course, you can get into individual verses, whether that be memory verses through different programs or you're just wanting them to highlight specific verses uh, in the text for you as they begin to get older. Which verse in this story did you really like? Let's underline it. Let's deal with it. Let's study this. Let's think about it. Let's memorize it. Let's meditate on it. And so what we're doing when we're talking about cultivating the Bible knowledge in what I really want to impress upon you is you're not just reading the Bible to your kids. If you think that the way to have a Bible to your kids is you sit down at the table and just read the Bible to your kids, your, your kids are going to be getting probably very little. Now, it's, it's a slow trickle, but I want you to dump buckets on them, okay? And so I want you to be coming in with force and thinking from the big picture down to the individual verse and the words of the text, what it is that they're growing in in their knowledge, all the way down the funnel till they get the pieces of the Bible. This is going to be very helpful. Now, I'm going to somewhat stand to the side here, um, because I want to give you some uh, books, and if you guys want, you can just take some pictures. Uh, these are, again, for more of the elementary or younger kids, um, and if you want recommendations for older ones, I can give those to you, but uh, here's some Bibles that I suggest if you, uh, if you need Bible recommendations. The Beginner's Bible is, is for little, little, little ones. This is for you to read to get the general sense of what 
the Word of God is all about. The beginner, Beginner's Gospel Story Bible is a, uh, v- a very similar approach to the Beginner's Bible. One step further, this is kind of going in order here of what my suggestion would be, to help them understand the big picture, like we talked about, that the, the, the Bible is really all about the redemption story of what God is doing through Jesus and bringing about a kingdom. That's going to happen in that. The Jesus Storybook Bible is probably my number one recommendation of keeping Jesus at the center of every story of every page of scripture going through and referencing all three of these this far are just referencing uh, the scripture and kind of giving a story and then the gospel story bible is the next step up from the beginner story bible that as your kids get older they can jump in and then this one on the very far right the biggest story bible this came out very recent recently this is a work um, uh, that's it's a, it's fat it's like this big and it just takes this one step deeper if you're at the point where you're diving into the greatest stories bible um, you need to be doing that alongside an actual bible because at once you get past this phase of the gospel story bible you want to have the actual page and text of scripture whether it's a children's bible or an adventure bible or something like that so here's some things um, in terms of getting to understand the uh, the reality of what each book of the Bible is about, the, the penultimate resource that you should be doing with your kids is Pastor Mike's Bible Survey for Kids. And I'm not just saying that because it's Pastor Mike and I want to sell Bible Survey for Kids because I don't really care and he doesn't make any money, nor do we. Uh, it is because I've never seen anything like this before. It doesn't really exist. This is going to have you as a parent walk with your kids through each book of the Bible and help them understand what that book of the Bible is about and do it on their own and gain some depth of knowledge and understanding on the books of the Bible. We have that in our bookstore here for you. If you don't have one, if you haven't done it, you should pick it up. Again, this is more so for elementary school age kids, uh, but this could be really helpful. And I put a wanna up here because... I think most of our churches do Awana, but not all of them do Awana, but some sort of program that is taking individual Bible verses and getting them into your kid's head, memorizing them so that that is sticking in their heart for God to be able to use later. I can't recommend that enough. Uh, A few more. Resources. This this is just a smattering. This this list could go on a, a lot. These are some of my favorite books for young kids and elementary school age kids. And there's movies on here too. The Garden, the Curtain, the Cross. Again, is giving a big picture of what the Bible is all about. I really want your kids to know that big picture piece of the Bible. That's gonna be really helpful for them to care about the Bible when they understand what it's all about. And then uh, the the biggest story is a, a shortened version truncated version of that other Bible that I showed you that goes through the whole thing, Bible stories. We've got uh, diving down deeper for older kids as you get into specific Bible studies made for kids to get into books of the Bible. And then something that I've utilized that I would recommend you utilize uh, is when you find resources that are helpful and work, use them. This uh, series, which I don't know if I've seen all the series, so I can't really recommend everything, but at least the one that's called God With Us, it's uh, the Voice of the Martyrs did this cartoon series of the Gospel of John, and it is just the Gospel of John. And so if you've got kids sitting around and they're not really doing anything productive, I've had my kids probably watch this, I don't know, 20 times, where they just click it on and it's just straight the Gospel of John in a cartoon fashion. They're using the exact words. John the Baptist, for some reason, is ripped, even though he should be skinny because all he eats is bugs. But he looks at him and he says, you brood of vipers. I mean, it's awesome. So um, they're getting the, the whole thing. And so these type of resources, again, can just be something that's just trickling in your home. You're reading these at night with your kids. You're going through them over and over and over again. Just some resources for you. All right. Um, in addition to cultivating just Bible knowledge in terms of reading the Bible, I think that there should be an effort on your part to at least establish some basic theology in your kid's life and then extend that beyond. The basic theology uh, that, that we suggest, that I suggest as a kidsman pastor that I want our kids to know in our church is I want them to know the core basic theological realities that are gonna help inform the gospel, okay? That's what I care about, first and foremost. Everything else after that, great, gravy on top. But I want them to understand the core pieces of what makes up a good understanding of the gospel and to do this, we've just used our umbrella strategy, but one of the, these are the core things that I would say. If your kid does not have a firm grasp of knowledge and understanding on these things, get them to have it. Whatever it takes for you to have it, they need to know it. They need to have a high view of God, 
and they need to understand these at least four components which are part of our umbrella analogy. They need to know that God is creator. That is going to inform them that God is the one that makes up the rules. He is an authority. He has the position. You are a creature. He is creator. Uh, don't underestimate the power of this particular theological truth about God, that he is creator. If this is not in place, typically, in the life of kids theologically, as they continue on, they, they can easily live in rebellion against God because they don't understand this simple truth. As you dive down further, knowing that God created all things and created us uh, in his image, then we want to talk about how God is separate, how he is holy, how he is other, how nothing can come before him that is impure or unclean or sinful. This is informing, even if you're not giving a clear, direct call of them to repent at an early age, you're informing aspects of the gospel early on with your kids by getting them to understand these points. And this is, again, the core thrust of the gospel message and the foundations of it. So make sure these are in place. God is creator. God is holy. God is just. He cannot just have sin be pardoned. He has to have some sort of payment for it. He cannot just ignore it. He can't just forget about it. He has to do something about it in his justice. And then we want to go to God is love, understanding that he has provided a means through Christ. These four things sound really simple, but they're very, very many levels deep you can go. I can stand in front of and have, at times, a group of sparkies in our, in, our, in our Awana program and explain that God is holy and what that means. My wife can do it with a group of cubbies, because I'm terrified of the cubbies, um, the little tiny ones. I'm like, hi, and I, I just can't do it, and then Pastor Lucas makes fun of me. Um, you can go and just say the simple, what does this mean? How does this work for the littlest one? And then it can go to infinite levels as your kids get older. As you think through this, you should always be thinking layers, layers, layers. And so I don't want anybody here saying, I've covered this with my kids when they were six, when they were nine, when they were 10, when they were 11. I'm now moving on to deeper, more heavy things. Uh, move on to those things while you continue to reinforce these truths about God. That's a very essential aspect. Uh, I want our kids to have a correct view of people. Um, I want them to know that they are sinful, so I want them to know the bad news, and I want them to be informed with that. I don't think parents do this enough uh, nowadays. They uh, pat their kids on the back, and they tell them that they're amazing, and God made them special, and they're so unique and so great, and that is never appropriately balanced with their um, sinfulness before God. Uh, we view it as something that is going to um, cause our kids to be depressed, or downtrodden, or hurt, or dismayed. Um, this doesn't have to be like that. Uh, a simple understanding of mankind's fallenness is not too difficult for a kid to understand at any age, and it will slowly shift just by you talking about it into a direct uh, ass assault on them that they themselves are sinful. They get this very quickly. They understand it, but they understand it layers deep. So they need to understand sin, and then as a layer on this, this isn't necessarily a part of uh, absolute necessary for the gospel. Um, I do think it's important for you, just as parents, to know this and to make sure your kids knew, know this, because we throw out the words good and good job and, and you're so great and things like this all the time, that there is a, there is a difference between relative righteousness and absolute righteousness. Um, I was talking to someone earlier today. Uh, about their kids, and I, I, I said, how are your kids? Are, are, they, are you surviving? And I said, are they good? And of course, what I meant by that was not, are they in right standing before God in absolute righteousness, right? You know what I mean. I mean relatively righteous. And I actually think it's helpful for you as a parent to live within a framework, theologically, that you could be calling your kids to relative righteousness in comparison to the rest of the kids out there. You need to be good. You need to obey. You need to do these things. And you praise them for being good. And yet there is a clear distinction between that level of goodness and the goodness that God requires that can only be purchased through the blood of Christ. And so uh, that distinction is helpful for you in your parenting because I've seen some parents uh, not want to ever praise their kids or push them to be good because they don't want them to be moral. 
uh, or just, or not they want them to be moral, but they don't want them to just, just be moral apart from Christ or to think that their good works are pleasing Christ. You can do both of these things at the same time. We want our kids to be obedient. We want them to respond to God's word in obedience even before they are saved as much as their ability allows them to. And then as they get to the point where they recognize that they're incapable of doing so, as they recognize that even one small thing, as it says in James, uh, one sin makes them guilty of it all and they have need for absolute righteousness that can be purchased through Christ, we, we, we give that, which of course is the last thing. We want to proclaim a biblical gospel. Uh, and this is, of course, the good news. Let me rant for one second. Um, as a Kidsman's pastor, I do this rant if you work on my team. We tend to present the gospel to kid, kids in a way that I find to be not so great. And what I mean by that is that we look at them and we think they can't understand the words that I'm saying, and so therefore I'm going to modify. I'm going to modify my message of the gospel. Uh, in so doing, what we often do is we, uh, we remove the truthfulness of the gospel, we truncate it in its, in its uh, effect, because we are trying to uh, get it down to their level. My proposal in sharing the gospel with kids is to give them as much as you can and in words that they will understand without oversimplifying or changing the message, give them the gospel fully. And if they don't understand something, that's okay because we're building this over time. We're helping them to understand this over time. Don't just look at them and say, God loves you so much and he wants you to live with him forever in heaven. Okay, we're, we're truncating and oversimplifying the gospel when we do this to our kids. If they are not understanding sin, if they're not understanding the right response to the gospel, they are not getting the gospel. You're giving them a shortened version. And we do this because we, we want to see some sort of responsiveness to our kids from the gospel early because it makes us feel better inside. And what I would say is, wouldn't you feel better if they had a right response to the gospel without you knowing it internally? God regenerates them because they actually heard the gospel instead of some sort of oversimplified version of the gospel that actually isn't the gospel at all, that doesn't even have the power to get them to respond to the gospel because they don't understand it, I would rather be clear in my gospel presentation to kids and let them respond how they respond without pushing, without jumping on it, which is something that I encourage all of our team to do with kids, little ones at least. As I said, I always want to present the whole gospel and its clarity and the right response. I want to talk about repentance and I want to talk about faith and I want to be really clear what those two things are. And the only thing I do different with kids is if I'm dealing with little kids, say I'm, I'm dealing with like a, a seven-year-old like I have, I just stop one tiny little step short of calling them out with the gospel and saying, you need to repent. And the reason why is because I can get them all to raise their hand and come down the aisle and do what they're going to do. But I want that, even that response to be clear. I want them to know what repentance is. I want them to know what faith is. I want them to know the clear biblical gospel because, again, that is the goal of having our kids be Bible-centered is that they understand the Word of God and, first and foremost, understand the gospel. They're in the Word. God's going to use the Word. He's going to use it like he does in Timothy's life to make him wise for salvation. God is able to do that, and he's going to use this, but we need to be accurate and we need to be clear. Okay, that's my rant. We have things that can help you with this. Uh, these are two videos on our, our AV website that we have. This is our uh, animated version of the umbrella illustration. I'm sure you've seen that in various forms. I did a video for kids, for kids to understand what repentance is to help build that understanding for them. We've done other videos like that, and we'll continue to do those to help kids, and I'm sure your churches have done similar things or booklets or helps for your kids. Uh, if you do... Uh, need help or want to go deeper, a good parent resource is Bruce Ware's new book, or I don't know how new it is, but Big Truth for Young Hearts. Um, there's always resources. Um, William Lane Craig has this little series on uh, attributes of God, and it's a little weird because there's a bear married to a goose, but we just don't get into it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and then there's this, this book is fairly new and it's, it's okay. It's, 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 uh, it's helpful and useful if you go through it with your kids. It is a theology book for kids uh, that you can use as a resource. I suggest to use it as a resource more so than just handing it to your kids and letting them go through. Okay. We're definitely not going to have a Q&A. Okay. Uh, to go back to our passage about um, uh, the parable of the sower, um, 
you need to be sowing seeds, but we don't live in a world where, and I, and I know you know this, but I just need to say it again. If you were the best at this, if you were the absolute best at training your kids with Bible knowledge and theology, I, I don't still think that that is, is everything that's on your list of tasks to do because we live in a world. In the same way that, that Jesus doesn't say in this parable, the, the sower went out and he sowed seeds and he sowed seeds and he sowed seeds and it just worked out. He's giving an illustration of the realities of life, the realities of the world that we live in, and saying that, yes, yeah, some fell on dry, compacted, hard soil on the path, and there's also these other things you know about birds, in my case, squirrels, that come in and try to take away what you tried to sow in your planting. And we live in that same type of world where there's going to be forces at play in our discipleship of our kids and our parenting of our kids and our trying to get them to be Bible-centered and to respond to the gospel that are going to be factors for us that we, like Jesus says, need to consider and think about in our parenting. So uh, in this case, he's talking about the birds. The birds that come in, which he gives us later, is saying that these are the, the, the workers of Satan, these are the demons, this is the evil one coming in and snatching away this before it can have any root. And, uh, and then as this parable goes on, he gives more. But I'll, I want to say it this way. We need to not just cultivate some Bible knowledge, but we need to counter biblical attacks with our kids. It's not enough nowadays for us to just sit idly by and scatter seed, scatter seed. That's the thing. That's the means by which our kids are going to get saved. There's no question about it. The instrumentality of the Word of God is the thing. But we need to counter biblical attacks because there are agents, spiritual forces that are out there and individuals that are motivated by these, either internally or externally, that they, uh, they are trying to get our kids to take that truth and, and, and get away from it. So let me give you a few things here. Um, there is two types of uh, attacks going on that I'll just highlight for you. It's perversion of the biblical truth. I'll say this. There are many out there that are perverting the biblical truth. Uh, these are what I would consider unbiblical churches, unbiblical Christians. These are cults of Christianity, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, whatever it may be, that are attempting to take uh, uh, Scripture and pervert it, taking the actual Word of God and, and turn it into something else. And they go about this in two ways, typically, and you need to be on the lookout for this, and I'll give you a response to it. Uh, one of those ways is by uh, pushing a biblical view that is married with worldliness, which is what we know in James. Those two things cannot coalesce. You cannot be friends with the world and friends with God. Uh, uh, that is, he calls them adulterous people because they're, they're sleeping in these two beds at the same time. And we have passages that are so clear on this. Um, this one in Second Peter is good. Is they, he, and this is a great insult. If you ever need a good biblical insult, you can call someone a blot and a blemish. Um, <laughs> But he's calling these teachers within um, these you know, churches and these Christians that they're there and they're there to entice unsteady souls. And they're doing it for their own, their own desire. They have an in insatiable desire for sin, whether that's a sexual sin or greed or whatever it is. And these are essentially non-believers that are out there seeking to pervert the truth. And as it says even more clearly in the book of Jude, that there are people who are not a part of the household of God that look like they're a part of the household of God who are out there perverting the grace of God, and they're doing it by sensuality, by, uh, by worldliness, by pursue, pursuing their own desires and the desires of the world, which is very similar to how Jesus gives an explanation of the parable that the cares of the world come in and they choke out these seeds, okay? The cares of the world, they come in and they, they scorch as they come in. So we, we need to be careful for perversion of biblical truth through worldliness, uh, but also through false doctrine. And we know this so very clearly in Scripture, um, so many places we could go to, but um, this particular passage, and I think we're here now, there is a time coming, and I think we could say it is here now, where uh, people will not endure sound teaching. They don't want to hear sound teaching. They want to go to a church that tickles their ears and gives them a pat on the back and teaches them about prosperity. Uh, they have itching ears, and they want to accumulate for themselves, teachers, pastors, preachers, other Christians who are able to fulfill and suit their own desires and uh, turn essentially those who are trying to listen to the truth away and into different things. And so these are two areas that we need to be aware of uh, as we're trying to get our kids to be Bible-centered, that they need to, they need, we need to be careful that we're countering these two uh, types of unbiblical perversions of the truth. 
Uh, how do you do this? I'll just walk you through this quickly um, through just one book of the Bible. Uh, 2 Timothy is a great book. If you were to just take this and read this as a manual for how to help uh, prevent this in your kids' lives, I think that this would be a helpful tool, but I'll just rattle off some here. It, it means, first and foremost, that uh, if, if if you need to protect your kids and counter biblical attacks against your kids, you should probably know the truth yourself so that you can defend it. Pretty obvious. Uh, you need to be able to guard this truth, which means be able to defend against it as people come uh, against it, to be able to uh, lay out boundaries as people come against it and say, we know that that's not true, and to be able to take your responsibility to put a, a protection around your kids to guard the truth. Clearly, you need to, and it says very clearly in this text, that when we have false teachers or those that are perverting the truth, we need to avoid them. We, we don't dabble with those that are uh, Christians in name only that are seeking to destroy our kids. We avoid these people. We don't go to their churches. We don't listen to their sermons. We don't read their books, and even if they're on the, 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 the Target bookshelves. If they are not faithful biblical teachers and they're perverting the gospel, don't dabble. Avoid them. In response to that, we need to follow biblical leaders. We need to push our kids uh, to be entrusted to other faithful people. Paul is telling Timothy to, to in, uh, continue to entrust the gospel to other people so that they can instruct others. And so we can do that with our kids. We're wanting to give our kids only to those that we feel um, are the faithful teachers, good, solid biblical leaders. And then I think the, the passage that we should all take to heart, which is typically only applied to pastors is that we need to, to preach the word, to teach the word, to proclaim the word, uh, that the real way in which we are going to protect against this kind of false teaching is by constantly teaching the right doctrine. That's really the right response to this is uh, we need to know it, we need to be able to see it, identify it, guard against it, we need to stay away from these people, put ourselves under the leadership of those that know the word of God, and then we need to be people that are constantly proclaiming the truth of right theology, right doctrine, not perverting the scripture. Uh, last attack here, this idea of rocky soil, I know well because when I started my garden in my backyard, it was actually covered in rocks and it took us a few hours and I could tell you that nothing grows when you put it in rocks because I tried. Uh, it doesn't work. It needs to have root and uh, one of the things that I think about when I think about dealing with this type of soil in our kids' lives is we... Um, we don't realize that there are so many barriers. There's obstacles for the word of God to be able to root itself in. There are things that are standing in opposition for a proper rooting of the truth in their lives. And if we are not going and doing the work of removing those obstacles, then we're going to have a hard time seeing the word of God rooted in them. And so we've got to take on our responsibility to see these things removed. And so I'll say... Um, that, uh, that there is an undermining of biblical truth that is happening. So when we counter biblical talents, we need to counter the undermining of biblical truth. Um, a few passages on this uh, that I think are helpful. Uh, we know that this is our responsibility uh, to do this, that we are to not be held captive. We're to see to it that no one holds you captive. See to it that no one holds your kids captive by, by these philosophies, these worldly ideologies that are uh, seeking to undermine biblical truth or be a, a, a rock in place that causes them to doubt the faith to such a degree that the word cannot root. Uh, we know that these are, these are demonic, that these are worldly. They're not according to scripture, not according to Christ. Um, that you're always to be prepared, even as a parent, to make a defense even with your kids, for the truth that is with you to be able to defend the Bible and that we're going to even go to the point where we are actively destroying arguments raised up against Christ uh, for, uh, in, in this apologetics. And so this is an apologetics thing, and I'll just throw some um, things that I think are uh, the core pieces of apologetics issues that you should be dealing with kids. Uh, if you can cover these things over a length of time and get them to have... Uh, some framework in the arguments for the existence of God in helping them deal with creation and evolution and helping them deal with the flood, its reality, uh, dealing even with ancient flood myths and things like that. Problem of evil is a hard one, but just starting with that early can be very helpful. Um, all of these are really helpful. And that last one I'll say is becoming more and more of an issue of dealing with uh, harm, harm that is happening where uh, people are 
are saying that I don't want to be a Christian. I want to reject God. I want to reject the Bible because it is, uh, it hurts me. It hurts me. Uh, this is becoming an apologetics issue for us to be able to need to defend against this. Why is it that the, the, the sword of the word of God is supposed to do some harm to us and why that's a good thing? Uh, more resources, again, pictures if you want pictures. Um, these are resources for you as parents that I would encourage you to use as resources. Uh, they're not specifically for kids, but they're helpful to get a quick picture of uh, the topics. These are ones that I've used and recommend. Um, here's some for kids in particular that I find helpful. The book on the, you're right, that radical book for kids is my favorite book right now for my kids. Uh, I find it fascinating and awesome and weird and incredible all together. Uh, it talks about the Greek alphabet. It talks about people who died for their faith. It talks about the historical reliability of the Bible. It talks about theology. It talks about Old Testament books. It's, it's all over the place. It's radical. Um, um, here's some for you as families that you can go through. My wife just recently went through from Creation to Babel, which is an Answers in Genesis book, with our kids uh, to help kind of form that early understanding of God as creator, the book of Genesis, dealing with flood issues, creation issues, all of that kind of stuff. Very helpful books. You can grab those. Okay. Uh, perversion of the biblical truth, that the solution to that is for you to be a teacher of sound doctrine. Undermining biblical truth is for you to do some level of engagement in apologetics. And then um, I'll just say this, that, um, that uh, our kids are going to have internal, it's not just from the external, questions about the Word of God, questions about the Bible, questions about what is being taught. And so uh, you need to also be willing to answer your kids' questions that come up because you can't deal with everything on, as someone's asking. As someone is just asking a question, or as, as you're just trying to prepare them in advance, that's not how it always works. They might have something that comes up that you've dealt with 10 times, but now it's important to them. So don't just push away their questions. Don't, don't use these words. Don't just say, well, that's, just do it. The Bible says so. Uh, don't ask me. Just, I don't know, right? You can be honest and say, I'll look into that. I'll find out. I can help. But don't have this kind of approach with your kids. If they are questioning or have doubts or speculations, be sensitive to those things and find the answers for them and don't respond like that. All right. We're, we're skipping things. I'm going to go to my last point here. Um, I want to just say this. Uh, all of this um, is, uh, is a work that you're going to engage in, uh, but as it so clearly says that uh, Paul might water or plant and Apollos might water, but God is the one that gives the increase. And so as you're engaging in the Bible with your kids, I would encourage you to do this. I would encourage you to actually pray not just for your kids' salvation, which you should always be doing, but pray specifically for the Bible to be rooted and grounded in their lives, for the Bible to be center. And you can use Scripture to pray that the Bible would be impactful in their lives. A passage like this, you could take and turn this and pray this for your kids. You can pray that, that, uh, that the Word of God in their lives would not return void, that, that it would accomplish what He desires it to accomplish, that it would be salvation. We could pray that God's Word would serve as, as this sword that pierces, that is, this, that is this effective tool at revealing our kids' sin. We should be praying these specific things of how the Word of God is implemented in our kids' lives. You could pick any section of Psalm 119 and turn this into a prayer for your kids as you're relying on the Lord to see the growth happen in them as you do the hard work of seeing them in the Word of God. You can do things like praying, uh, God, I pray that you would guard my son, guard my daughter according to your word. Help them to seek you with their whole heart. Seek your word. Help them to store up their word in your heart. Help them not to despise it and help them to have it so they won't sin again. I mean, use these as prayers for your kids. And even as they think about their lives and you think about their lives and what you want them to be, you could pray that they would respond to your instruction as you seek to engage them in the Word of God and get them to be Bible-centered um, and helping them be attentive. So it is my encouragement to you as we do all of these things uh, that you are heavily reliant on God in this process, that you pray these things back to God and that you ultimately realize that the one that waters and the ones that plants were nothing, but it's God who is everything. He gives the increase. But that doesn't mean 
that we're not scattering seed. That doesn't mean that we're not watering. We are going to get out there every day and do the work in the garden that we need to do in our kids' lives to see them care about the Bible. All right, let me pray, and then uh, you guys are dismissed. God, we do ask, uh, first and foremost, for uh, you to come and uh, have a massive impact in the lives of our kids through your word. God, ultimately, we want to see all of our kids saved. We want to see them come to a saving knowledge of the truth. We know that your word is the thing that does that. And so, God, we ask that the word would be uh, powerful in our kids' lives, that it would function as you designed it to function, to pierce and to penetrate, to reveal our sin and reveal the solution in Christ uh, to the problem of our sin. God, help our kids to be uh, consumed with the word, and most importantly, with those sitting here, help our parents to be equipped better because of this Uh, day this weekend and because of your word to do the hard work of laboring in the garden of our kids lives to see the word cultivated in them so god we ask uh, that you would do these things for your honor and glory in jesus name amen